Welcome, and the peace of Christ be with you today, wherever you are. It is a beautiful day here in Sundridge at Zion United Church, and we are glad you, that you are worshiping with us today. I am Reverend Sandra Jenkinson, uh, minister here at Zion, and this is my husband, Reverend Fraser Williamson, who ministers at St. Paul's United Church in Golden Valley and St. Andrew's United in Port Loring. Behind the camera, we have Barbara Lee. At the piano is Kathy Sylvester. And our in-person congregation of one is Christine. Next week, the studio will move to St. Andrews. Of course, all of you watching are part of the Body of Christ, part of this congregation, whether you attend Zion or St. Paul's or St. Andrews, or whether you're from Nipissing or Restool or Magnetowan or Powassan or Chisholm or North Bay or even farther afield. Wherever you are, take a moment, feel the Holy Spirit in your soul. Let it connect you through time and space to the body of Christ found here and now. We open our worship today, as we do every week, by lighting the Christ candle. As we light this candle, we acknowledge that the light of Christ burns brightly not only in this space and time, but in every space and in every time. We open our hearts to Christ's light and to Christ's love and take up the task of sharing his light and life with our hurting world. Amen. And now our call to worship found in the bulletins that were emailed to you. Let the righteous be joyful. Let them rejoice before God. Let Let's us all, all be jubilant, jubilant with joy. joy. Sing to God all peoples of the world. Sing praises to God most high. From, From the, the sanctuary, sanctuary of heaven, heaven God gives life and, and renews the face of the earth. Let the righteous be joyful. Let them rejoice before God. Let, Let us all be jubilant with joy. And now for our opening hymn, Rejoice the Lord is King, found on the song sheet. Oh, 
us pray the opening prayer together. Holy One, we bring our undivided selves to worship this day. We bring our despair and our hope. We bring our fear and assurance. We bring our total selves into this community that we may worship you as people broken yet seeking to be made whole. As we worship, may our spirit bless and renew us through the promise of resurrection. Amen. Brothers and sisters, God not only desires our repentance, but longs to offer us forgiveness. Therefore, cast all your anxiety on God, because God cares for you eternally. Let us pray together the prayer of confession. Loving, Loving God, we confess that we do not always bring honor and glory to your name. We are rebellious and weak. We flee before your goodness. Forgive, restore, and strengthen us by the grace and mercy of Christ, that we may rise up again in peace to love and serve your world. Amen. Sisters and brothers, the Spirit of God is resting on you to restore, support, and strengthen you. Therefore, be at peace in the one who forgives and loves you. Rise up and give God thanks. And now let us pray the prayer for illumination. Spirit of glory, Spirit of God, bless us with the word of life this day to restore, support, and strengthen us as we seek to be one with you. Amen. And now reading our scripture, we have Heather Marchand of Zion in Sundridge. The scripture this week is taken from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 to 14, and chapter 5, verses 6 to 11. And it's titled, Suffering for Being a Christian. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on to test you, as though something strange were happening in you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of your, the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, but because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. I almost wonder if the writer of this first letter of Peter had a crystal ball and through some magic or divinely inspired power looked into that crystal ball to the year 2020. And in looking at this present time, he saw the adversary, the devil mentioned in chapter five, verse eight, in the form of a microscopic virus, prowling around, looking for someone to devour. For something so small, too small to be seen with the naked eye, certainly, this virus has us scared. We stay in our houses except for essential trips or for essential work. 
we have become more vigilant about washing our hands, not touching our faces, and disinfecting surfaces. We stay away from each other, doing our best to maintain a physical distance of six feet, or two meters if you grew up with the metric system, like me. And beyond our fear for our own health and well-being, we fear for those we love and care for. We worry that they may become sick. And if they are sick, that they might be able not, or not be able to fight it off. That their face will become one of the statistics reported at daily government press briefings. This virus has us scared. And in our fear, we are suffering. We are suffering the pain of isolation. We are suffering from lack of physical interaction because despite FaceTime visits or phone calls, I know of several grandparents who are suffering because they can't hold and hug their grandchildren right now. We are suffering because we can't gather for worship. For those working on the front lines, they are suffering under the weight of wearing personal protective equipment all day, suffering under the knowledge that they might be bringing the infection back home with them, or suffering because they don't even want to risk going home, and so they're living apart from those that they love. This virus has us suffering. The community that this ancient letter was written for was also experiencing suffering, or at least it's a pretty good guess that they were because the word suffering is mentioned 12 times in this short letter. So it's a major theme that runs through it. These early Christians were suffering because they faced difficulties and persecution for following the teachings of Jesus. Rather than a microscopic virus keeping them fearful, it was the Roman Empire. You see, the Romans demanded that everyone that lived in the empire put Caesar first, and because Christians put Christ first, they suffered at the hands of the empire at least until around 300 AD when Christianity became the state religion. So these early Christians are suffering and Peter writes to this community to encourage them, to urge them to continue to do what they are doing, to give them hope that God is working with them to bring about something new. Because that's what God does. God brings life from death. God transforms despair to hope. In 2020, Christians in North America are not persecuted for their faith, despite what some people that call themselves Christians claim. Now that's not true in all parts of the world, but in North America, Christians are not persecuted. We don't have to worry or live in fear for ourselves or our families because of what we believe, or worry about being targeted or fired for wearing a religious symbol or higher security when we gather for worship. There are people of other faiths in Canada that experience these things, but overwhelmingly Christians do not experience persecution for our faith. So what do these words written 2,000 years ago have to say to us as Christians today? Well, we're not suffering for our faith, but we are suffering. We are suffering as this virus exposes some grievous wrongs in our society. 
Our eyes have been opened and we are forced to accept our part in them. This virus has exposed an economic system that forces people to work multiple jobs just to pay the bills. Calls workers essential, yet pays them so little they can barely afford the essentials to live. This virus has exposed the way we care for our elders in for-profit institutions in the devastating number of deaths and situations of neglect in long-term care homes. This virus has exposed the lack of affordable housing as those on the streets do not have the luxury of a place to go into isolation. This virus has exposed the harm we as a species are doing to the planet and that Mother Nature can get along just fine and probably better without us. We are suffering because we are part of the social, political and economic systems that devalue human life and God's good creation. We are suffering because we are realizing that when Jesus told us to love our neighbor, he didn't just mean the neighbor who looks like us or goes to the same church as us or is on a similar economic level as us or is the same age as us or lives on the same continent as us. Jesus meant love that neighbor who is starving in a long-term care home because there is not enough staff to make sure they are fed. Jesus meant love that neighbor who has to work multiple jobs to feed their kids. Jesus meant love that neighbor who is dying because that discarded plastic bag floating in water gets tangled around its throat or into its digestive system. Jesus meant love that neighbor on the other side of the planet who is an environmental refugee fleeing another typhoon or flood because of global warming. Boy, Jesus asks a lot of us. Who really wants to pay higher taxes for more secure social programs or to pay more to health care workers or hire more inspectors to make sure long-term care homes are caring properly for residents? Who really wants to admit that most of us watching today and here present today live in a state of privilege and wealth that most in the world do not? It is a humbling thought. This virus has us scared and suffering. This virus has humbled us even as followers of Jesus. In the early days of lockdown, there was a meme on Facebook that said something like, Here's humanity saying we can't possibly shut down the economy, give workers a break, reduce pollution, and stay home. And it had God responding, here's a virus, practice. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. These words written so long ago remind us that, as Christians, we worship God, not Caesar. We follow Jesus to Jerusalem, not to Bay Street or to Wall Street. The words of 1 Peter remind and encourage us as Christians living in 2020 to resist the temptation to ignore the suffering of our neighbors, to resist that adversary, that devil prowling around, tempting one to care for only oneself, to look out for number one. Because that is the message we have overwhelmingly heard for so long from the culture we live in. And now we have been humbled. But from a place of humility, we are granted a new perspective. Now, we as a society are resisting the narrative that we always have to be buying, that if the poor just worked a little harder, their lot would improve, that our reliance on fossil fuels really isn't that bad, 
and it will be too costly to change our behavior. Now we hear stories of caring and compassion daily on the news, far more than we ever did before, I think. We hear about people stepping up to volunteer. We hear about abundant generosity. We hear about how things need to change so people can make a living wage at one job. We hear about connections made and communities formed. We hear about innovation and creativity flourishing. We hear about dolphins swimming in Venetian canals and that the top of Mount Kilimanjaro can be seen from 200 kilometers away for the first time in years because there is no longer hazy pollution covering its glory. Out of suffering, Beautiful things are arising. But maybe we shouldn't be surprised. Because that's what God does. God brings life from death. God transforms despair to hope. And this is the message Peter sends to those early Christians. And that we still hear today in these words written so long ago. The God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. When the suffering is over, there is restoration. When the suffering is over, there is new life and new strength. When the suffering is over, there is a new dawn and a new creation. So friends, hold on. In our humility, may we learn the lessons of this time. In our suffering, may we heed Jesus' call to love all of our neighbors more deeply and intentionally. In our faith, may we rally as Christians to seek a more just society and culture that puts people instead of economics first. And in love, May we give God the glory. Let me end with Peter's words. Chapter 5, verse 11. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. And now we have a special guest who is known around our area as the mayor of the unorganized township of Lount, Ken Crozier. Ken is a very talented musician, and he is performing his own original song, When I Look Back. Here is Ken. Hello, everybody. I'm in the United Church here with Sandra. She's got the phone in front of me, and she's, got, she's zooming in. I'm going to record this as my original song. And uh, I fancy got longer hair because uh, nobody would go to the, to the uh, uh, hairdresser yet. So I'm going to start looking like Mal Gibson and Braveheart. Okay, maybe I don't look like Mal Gibson, but I'm going to keep thinking I do. Anyways, but here's my song. Thank you.
Thank you, Ken, that was wonderful. And now it's the time for the offering. And obviously the offering plate cannot be passed during online worship. But Sandra and I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for the offerings you have sent, either by PAR, which is pre-authorized remittance, or by mail or other means during this time of physical distancing when we cannot gather together and pass the offering plate at Zion, St. Paul's, and St. Andrew's. Your gifts help with the ongoing expenses of the church as well as continuing to support mission projects both at the local level and beyond through the work of the United Church's Mission and Service Fund. Thankful, thank you for your uh, faithful giving. And if you've been meaning to sign up for PAR or send in that check or do that e-transfer, please do so. Whoever your church treasurer is, I am sure they're very happy to help you to give however way you want to do it. And we also remember that this time of worship is not only about giving back a portion of our financial gifts to the church to be used to participate in God's mission in the world. This is also a time when we offer all of our gifts to God in thanksgiving. There are many, many gifts we lift up and offer to God. So now I invite you to cup your hands together, close your eyes, and imagine putting all your gifts into your hands and lifting them up to God in offering. Let us pray. Loving and gracious God, we are grateful for Christ's life, death, and resurrection among us, bringing us to the fullness of life in the Spirit. Accept these gifts we offer in his name. Through them we pray that others might come to know the power of your Holy Spirit for their lives and the world. Amen. And now for the announcements or, or some refer to it as mission and work of the church. Um, as usual, we're getting increased numbers and we actually had an international attendee um, come to the uh, Loring and St. Paul's coffee hour. And uh, the coffee hour will be on Tuesday at 10 a.m. through Zoom. So please contact myself, Reverend Fraser or Debbie Dobbs to get the link. And at Zion, Heather Marchand is making face masks. And if you need a face mask, because it is now recommended, please contact her directly. And for Zion folks, Sandra will put Heather's contact information in her weekly email. And from other folks, if you email me, then I will uh, get you in touch with her as well. And at Zion, we're going to try another virtual coffee time on Monday, May 25th at 10 a.m. through Zoom. And uh, Sandra will send out the link so you can join in and hope to see you there. And thank you to uh, Lount Mayor Ken Crozier for sharing his song and Kathy for playing um, the wonderful music, Barbara for always running the camera, Heather for reading the scripture and Ron for the minute for mission. And don't forget, Christine is here and she's singing away and she's now <laughs> laughing at me. <laughs> and our minute for mission this week comes all the way from Bear Valley. We have Ron Holotuck who is celebrating his 50th wedding anniversary this weekend. So I would like to congratulate you, Ron and Lori, for 50 wonderful years. So here is Ron. The minute of permission for today is entitled Searching for Peace in the Korean Peninsula. Over 65 years ago, the Korean War ended in an armistice agreement. The agreement created the demilitarized zone 
or DMZ, a place where the two parts of the country can come together. The two parts of Korea, North and South, have a very different political and economic system and ideology. Some may think that differences are too great for the two countries to come overcome and unite. Mission and Service of the United Church of Canada supports partners like the National Council of Churches in Korea that are working to unite both countries through a path of peace. There have been nonviolent gatherings at the DMZ as well as walks for peace. We are thankful to be in partnership with Korean Voices for Peace and the World Council of Churches, which lift up the plight of families who are divided in a region that is still in conflict. The United Church is part of the Korean Peace Now, women mobilizing to the end to end the war, a global campaign to get a Korean peace agreement by 2020. We pray that reunification will take place and are thankful that we are able to support this path through our gifts for mission and service. If mission and service giving is already a regular part of your life, thank you so much. If you have not given, please join me in making mission and service giving a regular part of your life of faith. Loving our neighbor is at the heart of our mission and service. Thank you. Let us pray. Ever-present God, we give you thanks for your presence to your people, to your earth in times of suffering. We give you thanks that you were present to your people when they were captive in Egypt. We give you thanks for your presence when the people were in exile in Babylon. We give you thanks for your presence in your son Jesus, the suffering servant, who suffered so that we may be saved. We give you thanks for your presence to those in the early church who faced persecution. We give you thanks for your presence in our suffering now as we face this pandemic. We give you thanks for your presence in the frontline workers and those who make phone calls to shut-ins to those who give their gifts of music, to those who paint messages of hopes on signs, and to many others who are sharing your love and compassion to those who are suffering during this time. At this time, we pray for the family and friends of Jen Casey, who died last week in the Snowbirds plane crash. We pray for the people of India and Bangladesh who were hit with a massive cyclone. We pray for our earth, your creation, that it be healed from the effects of climate change. We pray for those who feel alone during this time, that they can feel your presence. We pray for those mourning loved ones during this time of social distancing, that they may feel your warmth and love. We pray for the researchers around the world who are working hard to find a vaccine for COVID-19. And now we pray silently those persons or concerns we wish to declare to you. We gather all these prayers into one as we pray the prayer your son, the suffering servant, taught us. Our oh, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
in our humility and with God's grace and love, go into the world. Go into the world to ease the suffering and be eased in your suffering. Go into the world to love your neighbor and to be loved by your neighbor. Go into the world secure in the knowledge that God is doing a new thing because that's what God does. And go now, blessed by the great love of God, the astounding grace of Jesus Christ, and the overwhelming joy of the Holy Spirit. May it be yours, now and forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.